Christmas 1916 was one of the coldest in living memory. Two and a half years of fighting had brought the Allies no closer to victory. The lack of progress brought a very senior casualty. General Joff, commander-in-chief of the French army, was sacked. His replacement was Robert Nivelle, a man who had begun the war as a mere colonel. Nivelle moved his headquarters from a suburban villa to this stunning chateau at Compiègne. New man, new style. France needed something new. She'd already lost 1,300,000 men killed or taken prisoner. The country was tired, desperate for a solution, and Nivelle had a master plan. Attacking with a million men, he'd win the war in one sudden, violent blow. And he'd do it in just 48 hours. Nivelle was charming, charismatic, and a hero of Verdun. His plan was irresistible, both to his exhausted army and to French politicians desperate for an end to the war. But the plan needed the help of the British, who might be harder to persuade. In February, the British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, brought a delegation to Calais. At 8 p.m. on the 26th, the day the conference opened, Nivelle and Briand, the French Premier, had a private meeting with Lloyd George. They handed him a copy of Nivelle's proposal. It was an extraordinary document, requesting not merely British support for the attack, but that the British Army should be placed under the command of Nivelle for the duration of the offensive. The British Prime Minister read the document, considered it, and then he agreed to its terms. It was an unprecedented decision. But Lloyd George liked the plan and was impressed by Nivelle, who was not only confident and persuasive, but spoke perfect English. Nivelle's plan promised the total destruction of the German army on the Western Front. The French would make the main attack, but the British army would strike the first blow on Vimy Ridge near Arras. On the filthy morning of the 9th of April, these trenches were packed with Canadian troops. At half past five, a signal gun boomed in the distance and nearly 3,000 Allied guns opened fire. As the barrage began, Canadian infantry scrambled up ladders leading out of these trenches and went into the attack. As our men went over the parapet, the heaven above them was a canopy of shrieking steel. It was the first hour of the Somme, repeated. The ridge was covered with shell holes and craters, and the infantry had to thread their way through them as they advanced. But the attack was very carefully planned and brilliantly executed. Although Canadian losses were heavy, German casualties were heavier still. By the end of the day, the Canadians had confirmed their growing reputation by taking the German trenches up here on the ridge. A week later, the French moved up for their attack. Edward Spears, a British liaison officer, observed Nivelle's mood on the eve of battle. He was like a man under a spell. The German defences were obliterated in his imagination, and he could see himself galloping in the open country beyond. At dawn on the 16th of April, three quarters of a million French troops would attack, uphill, towards the road known as the Chemin des Dames. Across a 40-mile front, tens of thousands of French troops left the safety of caves and dugouts and packed their front trenches. Then, with just 10 minutes to go, German artillery shelled this tempting target. It was no accident. 
the Germans had captured a copy of the French battle plan. But the French attacked anyway, toiling up these bare slopes in the face of howling sleet. The Germans had used deep caves behind their front line as protection from French artillery. As the attackers went in, German fire cut them to pieces. It was a massacre. French losses on the first day were 90,000. 30,000 more than the British lost on the first day of the Somme. This was much more than just another battle going sour. Nivelle had championed his cause so vigorously that his men had really believed in him, like a sick patient hoping for a miracle cure. And now it was ending up in mud and blood like all the rest. Edward Spears saw the survivors return. These men were broken in spirit as well as in body. They were discouraged as never before. It's all up, they said. We cannot do it. We shall never do it. C'est impossible. Although the offensive had obviously failed, the attacks went on. News of the disaster spread rapidly amongst troops waiting in reserve. As they were brought up to the front in trucks, they bleated like lambs going to slaughter. All hope had vanished. Since the outbreak of the war, the vast limestone caves just behind the front line had been home to French troops. Tens of thousands of men had passed through here, leaving etched on the walls the traces of their names, their regiments, and their faith that God would protect France. Those who were fortunate enough to survive the attack came back down here, tired and dejected. When they were ordered out to attack again on the Chemin des Dames, their dejection flared into outright rebellion. Some simply refused to move. Others turned up at the transport without their rifles. Short of shooting hundreds of their own men, there was nothing that the officers could do. Mutiny spread like wildfire through an army that was dangerously near breaking point. Within weeks, half the units in the French army had been affected. At Nivelle's elegant headquarters, there was growing panic. As May went on, there were more and more reports of mutiny. A general was shot at as he walked to his headquarters. Mutineers hijacked a train and set off for Paris. Men roamed the streets, shouting their demands. No more attacks, more leave, better food, better pay. Some even demanded an immediate peace. Although most soldiers still trusted their own officers, their disgust with the high command was intense. Les buveurs du sang, they called them, the drinkers of blood. Dr. Stéphane Audouin Rousseau is an expert on the French army mutinies. Les mutineries sont un phénomène spontané dont on sent d'ailleurs les prémices dès la fin de l'année 16 et qui est déclenché de manière tout à fait spontanée par un échec militaire et aussi par une grande espérance brisée. Car les soldats ont vraiment cru que l'offensive d'avril 1917 terminerait la guerre. Et c'est la déception après l'échec de cette offensive qui crée l'effondrement du moral et le mouvement tout à fait spontané des mutineries. Qu'est-ce que les, les, les hommes demandaient Alors, les hommes demandaient d'une part qu'on n'attaque plus dans ces conditions. C'est-à-dire que l'on abandonne l'idée d'attaque euh, qui avait en vue la rupture. 
euh, du front. Euh, ceci apparaît comme une sorte d'impossibilité et euh, les hommes veulent que le commandement prenne conscience de cette impossibilité. Et la deuxième chose, c'est que les soldats demandaient aussi des améliorations matérielles. L'augmentation du taux des permissions, une plus grande régularité, une amélioration de la nourriture. Il faut savoir que les conditions matérielles des soldats français étaient parmi les pires de, de, de celles de toutes les armées engagées dans le conflit allemande et, et, et britannique. In late May, Nivelle was sacked and replaced by Philippe Pétain, who had done so much to save Verdun. He immediately cancelled all attacks. Henceforth, they'd only be made economically with infantry and with a maximum of artillery. Pétain reasserted discipline, but he was not ruthless. 500 mutineers were sentenced to death, but far fewer were actually shot. He visited his regiments, listening carefully to the demands of the men. He made concessions. There would be better food, better pay, and more leave. Pétain had brought the French army back from the brink, but it would be many months before it was fit to fight again. The French managed to keep the scale of the mutinies secret, from the Germans and the British. It wasn't until June that Pétain's chief of staff visited Haig to admit that the French army was in a bad state of discipline. By then, the British were on the verge of a major offensive of their own near the little Belgian town of Ypres. The name was too much for most British soldiers, and they called it Wipers. Haig wanted to attack here for two reasons. First, to overrun German submarine bases on the Channel coast, and second, because a short advance would seize a key German railhead and break the Western Front. The British had held Ypres since October 1914, and two and a half years of shelling had reduced the town to rubble. Ypres lay at the center of what soldiers called the salient, a piece of land jutting out into hostile territory. The British could be shot at from the front, from the sides, and virtually from behind. And there was another problem. The Germans held the high ground, the ridges at Messines and Passchendaele. To break out of the salient and reach Haig's objectives, the British would have to take the ridges where the Germans had built some of the strongest defences on the Western Front. The attack on Messines would start, not on the ridge, but below it. The British were working underground, digging an elaborate network of tunnels right under the German lines at Messines Ridge. It was siege warfare, an intelligent way of reducing the attackers' casualties. Huge explosive charges were packed into the tunnels. It was hoped that when they were blown, they'd obliterate the German strong points. The mining operation had been a long time in the planning. Some of the tunnels had been started as early as 1950. By the summer of 1917, there were over 10,000 miners working underground. Philip, how extensive was the tunnelling under Messine Ridge? Oh, very. There was a very extensive network of shallow tunnels. And then at a deeper level, the actual tunnels that were driven to place the mines for the attack, it was, well, there was some nine kilometres of them. What were the technical problems? Well, the biggest problem with the deep mines was to get down through a band of wet sand, a bit like quicksand, to do that, they had to drive shafts as much as 60, even uh, 100 feet deep. And then they got into blue clay, and blue clay itself is difficult to dig. Amongst other things, it swells when exposed to air, and they had to put in very, very strong timbers. And even then, uh, those timbers were still cracked, and the tunnels often broke in on the miners. What sort of equipment did they use? Well, for silent digging, they used a specialist technique known as clay kicking. Now, 
Clay kicking was a process where a man was braced on a frame, had a special shovel, and using his feet, he would cut the face from uh, just ahead of him and, and work his way up. And it was, could be done very quietly and very quickly. But why quietly? Well, because the miners on both sides, of course, were listening for each other. And if they heard an enemy tunnel approaching, then they would seek to attack it, usually with explosions underground, but they might break into the enemy tunnels as well. Sometimes when they broke in, of course, you then got uh, underground fighting with knife, revolver, grenade, or explosive charges. In fact, sometimes they captured each other's tunnel systems and used them for themselves. And what about the explosives in the mines? Well, for the most part, they used aminol, and th that was generally came in rubberized bags. This is an aminol bag here, 25 pounds. But when you think about it, for the 24 mines that were actually laid, there was over a million pounds of explosive. That's 40,000 of these bags. Just getting those along these tunnels and placing them silently, uh, it was an extraordinary feat. Early on the morning of the 7th of June, the engineers made their final checks and waited for zero hour. 24 mines had been laid, but only 19 were to be used that day. They were to be exploded simultaneously, and then as the barrage crashed down, the attacking infantry would go in. This is one of the original exploders used that morning. At 3.10 precisely, the mines were blown. Nineteen mines went off that morning. This is the crater left by one of the smaller ones. The shock of the explosions was felt in London. In Lille, 20 kilometres away, the professor of geology jumped out of bed thinking that there'd been an earthquake. German defences were obliterated. The defenders were simply melted or buried under tons of earth. The survivors were in no fit state to fight. One British soldier said that they were white haggard, shaking with fright. By the end of the day, the British had taken Messine Ridge and the Germans had lost 25,000 men. It was an impressive start. Crown Prince Ruprecht, the commander of German forces in the salient, sent a hurried cable back to Berlin. He was convinced that the British would attack Passchendaele within days. He did not think he would be able to hold it. As the 8th of June dawned, the day after Messines, the Germans holding Passchendaele Ridge were anxiously awaiting an attack they were sure would come. It didn't. Not that day, not the next, and not the following week. The British had never intended to run the two battles together, and it would be weeks before they were ready to attack Passchendaele Ridge. The attack would be made by Sir Hubert Goff's 5th Army, Goff was Haig's youngest army commander, a cavalry officer renowned for his dash. But it was seven weeks before his force was finally ready. On the 15th of July, British artillery began pounding the German defences. Over four and a half million shells were fired. At dawn on the 31st, the infantry went in. The British had already perfected a new way of using artillery, the creeping barrage. Fire fell just in front of the infantry, who were trained to move so closely behind it that men were often killed by their own shells. Lieutenant Edwin Campion Vaughan, numb with fear, saw his men rise and walk unhesitatingly behind the barrage. 
The effect was so strong that I felt no more that awful dread of the shellfire, but followed them into that cracking, spitting hell. When the attackers reached this stream, the Steenbeek, they came under heavy fire from the far side. It may not look much now, but that day, it was a real showstopper. At four in the afternoon, it came on to rain. Heavy, torrential rain that turned this area into a quagmire. One gunner officer reported that the infantry were up to their waists in water. The Germans counterattacked, but the British held on to the ground they'd gained. As night fell, some of them found shelter, but most lay out here in the mud and rain, waiting for the dawn. The following day was the 1st of August, and it was one of the wettest for many years. It went on raining, without stopping, for four days and four nights. The battlefield turned into a swamp. Shell hole cut across shell hole, brim full of water and slimy mud. It was simply a soft, sloppy mess in which you sank up to the neck if you stepped from the duckboard. When I went on the duckboards, it started off towards the front line and I slipped off into a shell hole up to here, up to me, here, full of dead men. Stench, you know, it's terrible. And uh, they, they, uh, they were all going down. The officer came, came up to me, and and with another man, they pulled me out. Well, I might have drowned another man. You've heard of men drowning in shells? I could have drowned if I hadn't been pulled out. And uh, so I say, this officer got a flask out. He had a rum in it. And, Gave me a drink of rum, and I just went on. He cured me of wanting to be a soldier, I can tell you that. I didn't want to be a soldier anymore. <laughs> the British were attacking into a landscape dominated by hundreds of well-defended German pillboxes. Most shell fire simply bounced off. So it was the infantry, armed with rifle and grenade, who had to take them. One unit sent 160 men to attack a single bunker. Only 40 of them survived. Once they'd captured a pillbox, the British had some shelter from the German artillery and from the weather. But spending the night in a place like this could be a melancholy experience as the candles guttered and the whole structure shuddered with the bombardment. Lieutenant Vaughan sat here during the heavy rains of late summer and listened to the cries and groans of the wounded outside. Low sobs rose to despairing shrieks as the water rose in the shell holes they were sheltering in. Powerless to move, they drowned slowly. These dreadful conditions wore men down. I died in hell, wrote the poet Siegfried Sassoon. They called it passion there. The battle tested the limits of men's endurance. Discipline, natural deference, comradeship and sheer guts all helped. But for many, there was just numb resignation. The attacks ground on through August, through September, through October. Casualties mounted, 50,000, 100,000, 200,000. The war correspondent Philip Gibbs witnessed a transformation. For the first time, the British Army lost its spirit of optimism, and there was a sense of deadly depression among officers and men. They saw no ending of the war, 
and nothing except continuous slaughter. It was obvious that the battle wasn't going according to plan. And just as obvious how dreadful the battlefield had become. Why then did Haig continue? Because he believed fundamentally that the war was not about individual battles. He called it a great continuous engagement designed to wear down the manhood of a great power. As short-term objectives faded, this conviction did not. Passchendaele had become, quite simply, a battle of attrition, a head-on struggle between two mighty empires. Haig demanded that the offensive go on. But the British and Australians, who'd borne the brunt of the fighting, were worn out. Fresh troops would be needed. At dawn on the 6th of November, Canadian infantry went in for what everyone prayed would be the final attack. The crest of Passchendaele Ridge was still half a mile away. By now, the ridge was ravaged and almost featureless, and it took all the skill and courage for which the Canadians were famed to fight their way up it. The Germans were pushed back off the ridge, and as darkness fell, they fought on. During a long night, their artillery pounded the attackers. One Canadian machine gun team was shelled three times. The gunner was Private Reginald Lebrun, photographed with his team just before the battle. By morning, of our team of six, only my buddy Toombs and I were left. Then came the burst that got Toombs. It got him right in the head. It was a terrible feeling to be the only one left. Casualties were heavy, but the Canadians took Passchendaele. The offensive was finally over. The ridge was chosen as the site for Tyne Cot, the biggest Commonwealth war cemetery in the world. It had taken 99 days for soldiers of the Empire to slog their way the five miles to Passchendaele. Over a quarter of a million men had been lost. As the snows came again that winter, the Allies were confronted by a grim certainty. The battles of 1917 had shown that the war would not be won by a great offensive. It would be endured, and the side that won would be the side that endured the longest.